start the YouTube recording and then I will mute all. And I'm muting Larissa and Mark. Okay, everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for coming to LibBalm. We have a wonderful show today. We have um, uh, poets dialing in from Australia, dialing in at um, seven in the morning now, and we're very grateful that they came. Um, but before we hear from them, we're gonna hear from our co-hosts, uh, starting with Larissa Schmilo. Larissa's new novel is Fly Bang from Spite and Dival. Her first novel is Patient Women from Blaze Vox. Her poetry collections are Medusa's Country, Special Characters, In Paran, The Chapbook A Cure for Suicide, which is a wonderful chap, and the ebook Fib Sequence, um, uh, free to download from Argetist eBooks. Her poetry albums are The No Net World and Exorcism, for which she won the New Century Best Spoken Album, Bust, Sp the, excuse me, the New Century Best Spoken Word Album Award hmm, for Exorcism. Her work has appeared in the anthologies Measure for Measure, an anthology of poetic meters from Penguin Random House, Words for the Wedding from Penguin, Contemporary Russian Poetry from Dalkey, and Choice Words, Writers on Abortion from Haymarket. She's the original English language translator of the first futurist opera, Victory Over the Sun, performed at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Garage Museum of Moscow, the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Theaters and University Worldwide. She added to the anthology 21st Century Russian Poetry from Big Bridge and has been a translator on the Russian Bible um, for the Eugene A. Nida Institute for Biblical Scholarship of the American Bible Society. Larissa, will you read a poem for us today? I would love to read a poem today. Welcome to our poets from Australia. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. We have we have live Cassandra Atherton, um, Shastra Dio, Judith Crispin, and we have, as I understand it, a film from John Kinsella. So hold on to your seats. We have a great show for you tonight. I'm going to read a poem called Daddy's Elusive Love. Huh. I spent my whole life seeking it, wrecking, reeking, eking it in hydra-headed phalluses, in aliases and palaces, in mama 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 medusas, in mirrors and seducers. I looked for it in boxers, in the dumps of ten detoxes, in the roll of rundown rockers, in anal and banal boys. I slept with legions in every single region. I made love to none, loved only one. It all goes back to daddy. Daddy, I'm your caddy. I know you wanted a laddie. Sorry, I wasn't a lady. Family history is largely hysterical mystery. This old cold sold hold blow on me is moldy genealogy. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my co-host, Mark Vincennes who is an Anglo-Swiss poet, a fiction writer, a translator, an editor, a publisher, a designer, a multi-genre artist and musician. He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, which I have reviewed and think is fantastic, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. Vincent's news collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires, and a novella set in ancient China, The Three Towers of Tao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant, are both forthcoming in 2021 from Spoit and Dival. An album of music, ambience, and verse, left-hand clapping, is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincent's is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian, and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, um, which you can get from White Pine, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. About Vincenzo's poetry, Cole Svensson has said, Vincenzo's poetry asks large and eternal questions and then deftly turns our attention to sharp details, the small ringing specifics that make up the concrete world. And Tony Hoagland said, 
The ambitious poems of Mark Vincent don't fit into any poetic scene or aesthetic camp I can name. He is an internationalist and his work mixes far-flung flavors, a little heart crane, a little Italo Calvino, a little Pavese, possibly a little Vallejo, Vallejo, sorry. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote, and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium in Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Witterbinner Foundation for Poetry. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the Dynamic and Brilliant Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He has lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland and India, and that's the short list. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives in rural western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more coyotes and bears than people. But we are lucky to have this people with us today. Mark, are you going to give us a poem, please? I would be delighted, Larissa. Uh, and um, of course, uh, Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain was the inspiration for Moby Dick. Did you know that? No, you do now. <laughs> Did you know that? Di Boda? I don't know that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we do now. That's cool. <clears throat> so um, this poem is uh, from uh, a new book that I've just been working on recently. It's called uh, Humunculus. Um, it's about little men in big worlds. And this poem's called Endurance. The expiration of the empire, the incumbent flags of endurance. His lordship writes to you out of concern for your personal welfare. A case in point is said to be in the context of art, a failure for an immured goddess, or perhaps the words are but mere pinpoints on a feeble tenant. The hills are no forgery, your lordship. Now and then a little nonsensical. This favor we bestow, yes, she says in her affluence, shall we put them to the stake? We unlaid mysteries once. Time and sex were tied up in, bar, uh, in the bars of Hades or upon the bejeweled rocks, the clattering of the brass bells, tiger bright, or in the merest of things, among the flowers, amid the quivering reeds, along the embankment, in the exact observation of the tide. Am I a commuter among the bees, she thinks solemnly? In both this and that other Arcadia, lying under the dew, just one more grand rounds for both the petal and those few flies. And under there, where infinitudes romp and roam, where there is no feeling of therefore, where the heart's surprise gathers in folds and is pulled under the water where your good old goddess burns in her welfare less difficult and less important than that demure dance through time. But in both windows, we are getting close. And in each of our veins, the ascent is more than the mountain. Here in the wick, we have found the unconditional, that slow, steady, grassy wit. Unseasonal, unintentional, unwavering. Come about sweet whisper, some summer evening when we are too old to remember the odd thing wrapped in a newspaper. No telephone or telefax, no telemetry, nor tomoscopy. All these people and their possessions and the silence by the lake. How might we reflect ourselves in crystal or in cut glass? The failure is not in what carries the sky away, bird, beast, or lump, but in the choirs of water that run into the hills in their strange commotion. Thank you. 
Thank you for wonderful stuff. Thank you. Yay. And we have Jonathan now, um, who founded Unlikely Stories, uh, which has been running as a continuously updated web magazine since, uh, when was it? 1998. 1998. Unlikely Stories spawned a daughter company, Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five poetry books per year. Uh, Jonathan has lent editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as New Orleans Poetry Festival, Mad Hat Inc., and Big Bridge. He's organized literary performances in many, many places across the United States, including Alabama, California, Colorado, Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, North Carolina, Ohio, Washington State, and, and D.C. Um, his poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press, 2004, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust from Unlikely Books in 2006, Pathetic Gods from New Sins Press, Wing City Chap Books, 2008, and Standards of City, Sididi um, from Litfest Press, 2016, and the free e-chap, which you can get from Jeffrey Side's Argotist eBooks, um, is called Backstories and came out in 2017. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for giving us one of your poems. Thank you, Mark. So next week is our Founders Read, um, and I'll be reading my own poetry, but most weeks I read something that we um, published in the past week over on likelystories.org because, as the regulars have heard me say many times, I'm not that prolific, but I do publish a great deal. And this week we were honored and privileged to publish this poem by Sheila E. Murphy. It's called, I Listen to His Eyes by Sheila E. Murphy. He told me as we stood masked along the North Street side, he is depressed more than before. I tell him the same without the words I listen to his eyes. I watch him shift the mask, it's difficult to breathe. Yes, it is quiet near the sanity that we presume to hold and then retrieve and lose again. How are we neighbors anymore? How were we then? What is the meaning of Decidious, my lonely perfect friend? Why are we defined by what we barely can describe? The weather taints the skin. The street is full of gray. He told me he has lost so many decibels and pounds. I am in touch with hunger. I dispose of all the symptoms. We have many things to talk about. We are confounded by purported leadership synonymous with lust. The world is just a little round the world is not communicable. We thought we had it nailed, and now the fingerings have been forgotten, and the tones are long and broken, and then breathed so many times like bodies we believed we owned or were, that only hold a little while. Thank you. All right, let's move into our feature. Um, I believe we're going to start with a movie from John Kinsella. Mark's going to set that up for us. And let's hear about John. John Kinsella is the author of numerous books of poetry, fiction, criticism, and cross-genre work. His work has won numerous awards. He frequently works in collaboration with other writers, artists, musicians, and activists. He has published over 30 collections of poetry. Other experimental fiction include the novels Morpheus, Postcolonia, Lucida Indervella, and Hollow Earth. Django and Jezebel, forthcoming from Mad Hat Press, belongs to a family of a dozen novels and novellas written over a dozen years, all of them in dialogue, but all stand alone as well. They are writings of speculative paradox. John is a fellow of Churchill College, Cambridge University, and professor of literature and environment, Curtin University. And he couldn't be here this morning, but we, he did uh, leave us some videos and we're gonna watch those now, right, Mark? Yep, exactly. All right. Just give me a second. Hi, I'm John Kinsella, and this poem is called Winter Sunflower Concretion. And just to explain, over the last few decades, I've created poems that are then placed in situ uh, in the environment, um, in the tree, the garden, on the rock, wherever, and photograph them. 
sometimes I've drawn using charcoal on a piece of rock or whatever, as long as it doesn't damage anything, anything and it's uh, temper washes off. Sometimes I've drawn sand. Sometimes I've printed out on recycled paper and put it up there and then removed it. Um, this one, it's winter sunflower concretion, is because um, I'm actually seeing sunflowers flowering in the middle of winter here. You know, winter is um, 20 to 26 degrees centigrade days at the moment. It really is a sign of climate change. So this was set with a sunflower head in the middle of it. And there's a photo of that. But here's the poem. Winter sunflower concretion. Knowing the solstice will be within them shortly, the sunflowers urge towards flowering, a surge of last minute preparations on thinner than usual stems. Out of strings of sunlight low to valley's rim, these out of time hyper accumulators searching uneasy atmosphere above normal temperature. Not auspicious beginnings from soil to disclosure to set in search, but aware and awake and gathering with more at stake. Thank you. And I think that's it from John. Oh, okay, wonderful. All right. Next up we have Shastra Dio. Now let me unmute her real quick. Shastra, let's see if we can hear you. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Great, thank you. How are you? All righty. And you're drinking tea this morning? Yes. Excellent. Tea. Very warm. <laughs> Very good. Um, Shastra was born in Fiji, raised in Melbourne, and lives in Brisbane, Australia. Her first book, The Agonist, won the 2016 Arts Queensland Thomas Shepcott Poetry Prize and the 2018 Australian Literature Society Gold Medal. She was a participant in Express Media's Toolkits Digital Storytelling 2019 cohort, Running Dogs, Poets, and Micro Residents for October and November 2019, and State Library of Queensland's First Reader in Residence in 2020. Her chatbot, Variations on the Word Ghost, received second prize in the inaugural, in, inaugural HCP Digital Arts Prize. Excuse me, stammering today. <laughs> Shastra holds a Bachelor of Creative Arts in Writing and English Literature, First Class Honors in a University Medal in Creative Writing, a Master of Arts in Writing, Editing and Publishing, and is currently undertaking her PhD in Creative Writing at the University of Queensland. In 2018, she was a UQ Graduate School Global Change Scholar and a National Library of Australia Summer Scholar. Will you read for us this morning? Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really Thank grateful you. to be here and broadcasting from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people here in Australia, paying respect to any First Nations people who are watching now or later. Um, very grateful to be reading alongside John and Cassandra and Judith. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to get right into it. A manual for the prevention of hauntings. One, weigh the hands down with stones and throw them into a river. Not a lake, nor any still water. Let the fish fret away the fingertips. Two, the feet should be buried at a crossroads, toes turned eastward to stop lonely ghosts from finding their way home. Three, place each tooth in an envelope filled with salt, one for each lover to bury in pot plants, knife drawers, a clenched fist or beneath the tongue. Four, hide the hair in the old upholstery. Use it for needlework, for sewing up the wound, the scar. Let it dissolve, let it sink into the skin. Five, be sure to separate the kneecap from the tendon and ligament and grind it to dust in a mortar and pestle. 
scatter the bone fragments in a westward breeze. Do not let them beg. Do not let them kneel at the door. Six. The heart is best kept quashed under a metal plate in a quiet room with a lock on the door. Feel its pulse through the floorboards. It can never run away from you again. Seven. Keep the rib cage intact. Place a stone at its center and flood it with light. Soon you will hear the hum of a heartbeat. Soon you will be ready to start again. This next one is called Road Trip. In the summer of 1995, my mother and I took a road trip, followed the Murray River all the way to Echuca. Our lives were bundled up in garbage bags, weighing down the trunk, and at the start, the tiny hatchback could hardly make it up the hills. The engine was ragged as my mother's breathing. Every 20 kilometers, we'd stop and she'd throw a bag into the river. We would watch it long enough to make sure it would sink, then drive on lighter and lighter. I don't remember the trip back, but I imagine it must have been like the drive past the red gum wharf. Windows down, the freshwater wind soaking my hair. The engine was thrumming and I felt as though I could outrun anything. The soldier, too. Beirut, Odessa, Sarajevo. You stayed in empty houses, unlived, haunted by what came before. Where you lay awake for days unblinking. Where when you lay curled up under the bed, a figure formed of dust and motes framed the notches of your spine like an open parenthesis. Its breath warm and wet on the back of your neck always gone before morning, always gone whenever you turned your head. Where you set your bones back into their sockets, where sprawled in the bathtub, you reopened your wounds, dug out the bullets and held them to the light. The blood and breath in each particle of skin illuminated. The facade has crumbled, but the anatomy remains underneath. A few of the teeth in the left side of your jaw are loose and you have stood in front of the mirror for hours, searching your reflection, your face, your many faces for the defect, the poor weld, the men you have been, running your tongue over your swollen gums, wanting to open your mouth and reach inside with your fingers to twist and tear until you sever something, until you can finally pull the rot out. It's really nice just to see everyone's hands. Thank you. <laughs> this one's called, I saw the devil in the cane fields. I saw the devil in the cane fields in the Atherton summer. My nose was bleeding and there was no one out, not for miles or months. My father had followed the lake boats to Erie. He used to tie jitterbees to eagle claws and name the bait after my mother. But he never caught anything, not for years. So he named the bait after me instead. The devil held my hair back as I washed my face in the kitchen sink. The air was sticky and I could taste ozone in the back of my throat. The other boys had found scorch marks in the western fields and my hands still smelled of burnt sugar. The devil and I sat at opposite ends of the tiny dining table and listened to the roaches scuttle beneath the refrigerator. I watched the devil take the east road, hands in pockets, eyes on the stars. His shadow kept me company in the doorframe. One day's walk to reach Cairns. He had a sprawling gait, and I thought perhaps next time we'd try dancing. And I think I have time for 
just one more. So I'll finish on this one. It's called Scorched Earth. For a long time, I used to dream about smoke swirling in an empty room. The wood stumps we set to burn in the fireplace crumbled into ash and embers, transformed. The body and the space it occupies set alight. The body and the space it occupied dispersed, exploded, illuminated like dust particles in a shaft of light. The smoke still rises, the scent of scorch lingers, trapped despite the passing of years. The more I think about your body, the more I know it is no longer your own. Your heart is a house with the doors left open. Your brain is the basement filled with smoke. The skeleton hidden under the flesh of floorboards. A stranger roaming the hallways, a dappled shadow splashed on the wall flickering in firelight. I remember peeling peaches in the gloaming, juice loosing down your chin. The moths threw themselves on the bonfire and I knew what it was to burn. Your eyes alight and gleaming, insects swelling a crown around your skull. The world was on fire and your fingers popped as you pressed your palms over the whites of my eyes. The beat of your heart, like an unlatched door, open, shut, open. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Really wonderful stuff. Um, before we continue, Larissa, uh, do we have a full slide for the open mic or? Oh, you're still muted. You're still muted, dear Larissa. Okay. Hello, dear Jonathan. Um, we have three people in the open mic. We can sneak two more in if somebody would like to join us today. Okay. So if anybody wants to do that, if, uh, you'll leave a message. Mark, Marcus well. Breen just put up his hand over there. Who is that put, his, put up his hand? Marcus Breen. Marcus Breen. You got All him? right, and if anybody else wants to go, if you'll just uh, type into the chat and we'll let you go after the features. And our next feature is Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra, are you unmuted? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Uh, is that your sparkly dress today? It is. All right, excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, Cassandra Atherton is an award-winning prose poet and scholar of prose poetry. Her books of prose poems include After Lolita, Exhumed, Trace, Picadon, Pre-Raphaelite, and Leftovers. She is the recipient of international and national grants and prizes for her prose poetry, including Australia Council Grant, Vic Arts Grants, a Blanc Literary Award, and the Selene Prize. Cassandra's scholarship on the prose poem includes the recent monograph, Prose Poetry, an introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is a commissioning editor for Western League Magazine, series editor for Spineless Wonders, and an associate professor of writing and literature in Melbourne. And she and I are working on a book of high buns, yes? Absolutely, yeah, it's wonderful to get a high bun in my inbox in the morning. So um, hopefully we'll be able to keep progressing with that, so yeah. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Jonathan. You published one of my first books of prose poetry uh, probably over a decade ago now. So that's wonderful. And to Mark and Larissa, it's a real honor to, to be here. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I write, which is Wurundjeri land here um, where I am and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I am a prose poet, as Jonathan mentioned, so I don't write anything but prose poetry. I'm quite obsessed with the form. Um, and there's one poem that I'm sort of known for that I always get asked uh, to read. So I'm gonna read that first and it's in, hooray, I got an advanced copy of the, um, of the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry, which I co-edited and it has John and Shastra and Judith's brilliant uh, prose poems in here. So I kind of feel like it's a nice way to begin bringing us all together. And it's called Bonds, which is um, an iconic Australian brand. Um, they make a white cotton t-shirt. 
You wore a white Bonds t-shirt to bed last night, a plain white, no nonsense Bonds t-shirt, and I knew it was over. I heard the death knell. And when you asked me if I was Emily Dickinson's ear, I nodded, solitary, solitaire, solipsist. For whom does the bell toll, you asked that afternoon? Campanologists? Two in Campania? Campaniles? It tolls for thee. R.I.P. my lover. R.I.P. my Van Winkle. Rip out my heart. Wrap it in your white t-shirt and bury it beneath your floorboards, still beating, my little drummer boy. You can beat me, but I won't be your fiendish queen, my butcher. My blood on your t-shirt will form a scarlet letter. Spot. Out, damn spot. You wore a white t-shirt to bed last night when all I wanted was to be stuck to your back. When all I asked was to peel myself off you in the morning and mount your erect compass needle. But now we are done, done, and you peel me like a grape. I slither out of my skin, skinner, skin me alive. I thought we were conjoined, destined to travel in circles until we met again in the middle, until we found our core, but like Nabokov's apples, all you manage to achieve is to tempt me with repetition. When I am only your dystopian Eve, there can be no valedictions here. So now our lives are cotton. And although cotton breathes, it is also the sarcophagus of our relationship. Embalmed memories. But I promise to dig you up, like Heathcliff or Rossetti. I promise to unbind you and gather you in my arms, skin on skin. My sweat will be our glue as I rip off that t-shirt and bond you to me one last time. Thank you. Um, I wrote that about my husband and he goes, oh, Cassandra, I was just cold. So um, <laughs> he hates it when I read that. Um, the second poem I'd like to read is, um, has actually been chosen by the brilliant prose poet and critic Peter Johnson for a special edition that he's doing of um, of a journal called um, Hole in the Head. And so I have a couple of poems in there that are part of a sequence on um, lovers who leave, basically. So the first one is called Pilot. There was something about a cockpit, something about its root meaning, a pit of fighting cocks, poesque, like the pit and the pendulum, but with cocks. Deplaning from a flight to Boston, you asked me if I'd like to see the flight deck, touch your flight instruments. You steered me into the cockpit like I was attached to your tiller, telling me to follow my nose wheel. The golden stripes on your sleeves and the celestial wings on your hat were backed in deep blue. You slid into the pilot seat, tiny computer screens moving with maps and measurements. I liked the switches on the roof, you wanted to show me your thrust lever, but every time we had sex, it was like you were on autopilot. I wanted some throttle, but you always seemed to need guidance. You said our relationship had too much of a negative feedback loop. I told you the experience was a real your dampener. I'll miss the Krug in the first class lounge for breakfast and the iconic deconstructed pavlova in a glass served with seasonal fruits and topped with Persian fairy floss but I need more hands-on approach, whereas you liked to watch. The second one from that uh, series is called Violinist. So they're all named after um, occupations of lovers. I liked it when you said Stradivarius in the dark and the odd way you said Par Chabelle's Canon with a long sounding pash at the beginning. For three years on Saturdays, I'd come to your apartment and eat iced vovos while you played Shostakovich's trio number two, until the cut on your finger opened and dropped blood on your fingerboard. Sometimes you'd reward me by playing The Devil Went Down to Georgia, and I'd dance around the living room singing Fire on the Mountain, Run Boys Run. You put your violin in its case and lick rogue flakes of coconut from my eyelashes. In bed, I called you Paganini, whispering devil's violinist in your ear as you played my backbone, 12 bones per second. I loved the feel of the calluses where your violin rested below the angle of your jaw and above your collarbone. I nuzzled their redness while your finger pizzicatoed up the back of my thigh. I liked it when you ran your bow across the sheen of my hair, imagining the music. 
But as you played the single string cadenza, I realized you didn't need any accompaniment. The last two are actually short ones from um, this book called Leftovers, which has an um, original painting by Phil Day on the cover of Awful, which I think is kind of quite fitting <laughs> because it's leftovers. Um, and the first one is sort of almost my, pro, my ode to the prose poem because um, I'm obsessed with the, with the right margin. So it's called Marginal. You catch my breath as it floats under a room of words. It warms your palms before easing through the spaces between your fingers, rising like a high sea. In this snuggery, we are a fragment of ourselves, a line without an ending, a gap in the kerning. Between your sheets, I am your skin and my heart, an ecstasy of limbs. When I leave your bed, my corpus haunted by your touch, I'm not sure what you will remember and how much time will smooth the edges of our ragged right margin. And the last one um, I'd like to read is sort of a bit of Faulkner transplanted to Victoria, um, Australia. My mother is a fish. I have buried her three times already, but the water table is high and she floats to the surface. I cleaned her using scissors to cut through the bones attached to her pelvic fins, but I can't cross the river while her cloudy eyes are directed at the sky. The tackle box is full of the rusty hooks of untried catches. I take a pitted sinker and use the fishing line to weigh down her fleshy isthmus. There is water in my shoes, but I can feel the stones rise beneath my feet. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Cassandra. Thanks again for being here at this hour. All right, next up we have Judith Nagala. Um, Crispin, and I will find her in the list and unmute her. Judith, how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> Good, how are you? <laughs> Excellent. What are you drinking this morning? Do you have coffee? coffee. Or? <laughs> yeah, Very good. coffee. <laughs> All right. Judith Nagala Crispin is a visual artist and poet. She has published two collections of poetry The Murbearers, um, published in Sydney by Puncher and Watchman and The Lumen Seed, published in New York by Daylight Books. She is currently poetry editor of the Canberra Times. How, how much poetry do they publish? Uh, they publish quite a lot. They publish at least one poem a week, sometimes more. Excellent. Is that, is that the newspaper of record in Canberra? I don't, I don't... Yeah, it's, the, it's Canberra's only newspaper. And I think oh, we're only, we're only uh, one of a handful of newspapers that still publish poetry in Australia. That's wonderful. Very cool. Um, Judith lives in a farmhouse in the Southern Tablelands with her family, her motorcycle, and a mongrel dingo rescued from the Tanami Desert as a puppy. Well, I suspect you're the only one here with a dingo, so I believe you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I just want to start by um, acknowledging the Ngunnawal Numbri people whose land I write on, the Bangarang people from whom I am descended, um, and the Walpri who care for the desert where I leave my heart at least once a year. Um, I'm going to start by reading uh, two poems from my five serenities for Marilinga. Normally, reading five is a kind of antisocial thing to do, so I'm going to limit all of the kind of nuclear disaster poems to two. A summer of aeroplanes, of air excited by radios, public, private and military. Ten-year-old Yami Lester played on Emu Field that day when all birds vanished, when nothing in that grassland breathed, and turning, by instinct stopping, he pressed knuckles into his eyes, a split second before the flash and double boom roared toward him like a crashing road train. And travelling in that sound, a blue-white diamond, a second sun, passing through the bones of his hands, left X-ray impressions of blood and skin, the intricate network of nerves, and his eyes burned. It was black when the pressure wave hit, a feeling of being underwater, and then the air sucked back, billowing out his body like sheets on a line. He didn't see the rain that smelled of chemicals and fell in dense, heavy drops. 
but he heard its tattoo and distantly from the direction of houses, his mother screaming. Number three. When they came to Juldil Kapi, called Juli, called All Day Soak, the United Aborigines mission in jeeps and covered trucks, they looked like moon men. Soldiers everywhere, the older ladies recalled. Guns, we all cry, cry, crying. Time enough to pack a dilly bag of clothes, a framed photograph, a child's favourite toy before the trucks rolled out, leaving mission buildings to heat and swallowing dunes. And she, between soldiers on those hard troopy seats, secretly fingers a stone held deep in the pockets of her skirt. Nulu stone, she thinks, last fragment of the meteor. Its dust colours her skin. A hundred kilometres to the south, departing helicopters drop leaflets written in English, warning Aboriginal people to not walk north. But here on the savannah, groups of figures separate in spin effects. And later, when the sky pressed toward them like a wall, they laid their bodies over their children and rose again coated in tar. Soldiers found them sleeping in the Maku bomb crater. They gave them showers and scrubbed their fingernails. But in the months that followed, their, their women gave birth to dead babies, to babies without lungs, babies without eyes, and their men speared kangaroos they couldn't cook because they were yellow inside. This next poem I wasn't going to read, but because we chatted about evangelists and the great damage that they're doing to the universe before um, we started this reading, I thought I would throw this one in for everybody. Um, it's called The First Descent of the Snake or How Billy Graham Was the Devil in the 1970s. In 1979, the domain was alive with doomsday prophets and Pentecostals. Perched on stepladders like rare birds, they proselytized or handed out leaflets for the wayside chapel. Sometimes people came to sit on the roots of giant Morton Bay figs. Poets and radicals, prostitutes, kids heading home from school, their shoes sinking in fermented fruit and the shit of bats. In those days, we all believed in salvation. The paraclete transfigured in every counterculture Jesus the ashram gurus in kaftans and beads who found visions in mushrooms or walked goats on a lead down Darlinghurst Road. From our balcony in the red light district, we watched the first Mardi Gras unfold its brilliant feathers down Oxford Street, past Sacred Heart Hospice, where Rosaline Norton, the witch of King's Cross lay dying, her eyebrows plucked to Gothic arches, still worshiping Pan. And all the Jesus freaks hung out at St. John's in ground so holy, even fig birds congregating in its camphor laurels dropped their guano in the petrol station next door. We were all waiting for the kingdom, couldn't see it had already come, and angels were only Japanese white ibis descending in the bay, the God Squad Harley Davidsons delivering toys to families in Redfern. Father Kennedy washing Mum Sherl's feet at the block. I don't know, I don't know when it all fell apart. I saw something but told no one at Randrick Racecourse, the night Billy Graham converted 85,000 souls to American corporate evangelism. Are you ready? Are you ready? His cadences surging in wind, the hallelujahs of hired gospel singers and a 1200 voiced choir. Australia could become the world's greatest religious superpower. And I remember how country bared her teeth. Woody pears rattling in the jaws of a southerly buster. Cloud banks muscling into light like tankers and how Billy stood, his arms outstretched like Christ in the pissing rain. A spotlight failed, showering him in sparks, and the grandstands opened, spewing out rivers of penitence, 
the sinner's prayer hovering on their tongues like burning doves, and later, Billy posed for photographs with Aboriginal children, their families left outside the fence. I recognised Daisy's granddad, who danced in black theatre and knew the Gadigal names for every constellation. He took my wrist gently through the wire. Not right way, he whispered. Not right to make magic in the rain. On my father's bookshelf, Billy points accusingly from the cover of Time magazine. He is dressed like a banker, his face contorted by holy rage. Behind his turned back, Eden. A woman stands naked under trees and a serpent, edgeless as the light, leans down and drops a seed into her palm. Each time the dream comes, I think I'm awake. Under my window, a jacaranda reaches from iron dark into the gleam of the oval coke sign, hanging like an eye over strip clubs and bars. And beyond it, the outlines of buildings drop to the sea, the oyster beaded cliffs, black oil water rolls across a moored ferry's prow. It is spring now. The air weighted frangipani, Firefoxes slow and still in the date palms. Downstairs, my mother plays her new Bob Dylan record. Man gave names to all the animals in the beginning, long time ago. I watch the ceiling shadows morph, where a corded light emerges from night's warp. Darkness lowers from herself an undulating length, white-throated falling in loops she arrives like a bird's neck turning. Headlights in the alley catch the moth pattern of her scales, her black seed eye then dark. She dislocates her jaw and in her mouth I learn the syllables of a language that uncoils like deserts erasing themselves in sand or the, la or the sound of landing spaceships. The prophets of the domain are gone now. Beneath those same ancient figs, I watch women in active wear check smart watches or eat wellness bowls from nearby cafe. It's 40 years since a snake dived from a darling her ceiling for the sake of a nine-year-old girl. 40 years since the enemy showed his face across the horse tracks at Randwick a white man standing in the cathedrals of rain and holding nothing holy. Do you think we've got time for one more or am I out of time now? I'll go for it. All right, I'll do one, I'll do one more. If I can actually find what I've done with the thing. Oh, here we go. This is called the wedge tails. Um, you guys, I don't think you guys have wedge tails in, in the States, do you? But a wedge tail is a, a really big, motley looking eagle. And this um, poem begins with a quote from Simone Weil. The sea is not less beautiful in our eyes because we know that sometimes ships are wrecked by it. King Tide, January 1976. The beach is an ivory line between spruce. Aeroplane armed, my brother runs through waist high grass. The sunlight skittering around him lifts static in his thin hair. From open sea, a kudawari wind. Lungs of the breath that formed us, that wove us together in secret when we were magicians and read auguries in tongues of sand. Mud creepers and whelks the sea returns its dead into our keeping. Mum's paisley sleeves billow as she waves us in, the sky flexing, clouds dilate to anvils above our tent and I remember how the sea withdrew. Through our valiant's rear window, tree lines thin to spinifex, the ochre bulls of dust rise shoulder to shoulder where we pass. And in the microsecond before dark, a wedge tail spirals to light between gigantic clouds. It is night. 
The radio emergency channel mutters under ululating gales. My brother sits between front seats, his face tinted green by the dash, crossed by fishtailing windscreen wipers. And in the southwest, ant trails of semi-trailers wind away and vanish. Our breath pools opal on the windows as we watch for shapeshifters, ochre striped and dark at the breast, holes where the rain does not fall, Mulaliapa. We watch for holes in the rain. To this sanctum of wind and silence and wind, we arrive endlessly, always following road trains, snaking endlessly into cyclone, where omen clouds advance like icebreakers and into the last slivers of light, the wedge tails come folding in. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, um, that's the end of our features. So I'm gonna turn it over to Larissa for the open mic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's please have another hand for Cassandra Atherton, Shastra Dio and Judith Christian. And thank you to John Kinsella for the film. Uh, a big hand for a wonderful feature. Thank you guys, it was fantastic. And thank you for getting up at seven in the morning. In the future, it's Sunday where you are, we're Saturday. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, it was wonderful. So before um, we go into the open mic, which is now closed, um, we, the open mic is not closed. We have a bunch of readers, good, great readers for you tonight. Um, before we go into it, I want to tell you about our upcoming show. We have a, to coin a phrase, a really big show um, on August 29th. We have a founders reading. Mark Vincennes, I, and Jonathan Penton will read a more extended reading. Um, each of us will do a more extended reading for the founders reading. And our special guests are, hold on to your seats, Quincy Troop and Keith Flynn, do not miss. That's August 29th, next Saturday. Be, be there or be square. There'll, and, there'll, there will also be a movie um, about the making of Quincy Troop's new um, recording album uh, with Keith. Um, so that's also something that, that's an exclusive that hasn't been out before. Uh, so we have an exclusive film on the making of, of that film. That's fantastic. Are we, well, we'll also get a little time for Q&A, won't we? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea is we'll show you the movie, we'll do a little Q&A, and then the gentlemen will read their, read their poems as well. So fantastic. Quincy Troop and Keith Flynn, plus the founders, what more could you want? Please come next Saturday, August 29th, 5 o'clock, live at 5. Um, and on September 5th, we have another great show for you. We have Ray Armentrop, Wang Ping, Lee Ann Brown, and Rian Amilcar Scott. So we have some great shows coming up. Um, so do, do join us. As I say, next week is the Founders Reading. So um, I now will open the open mic. And can we please unmute John Wessick? And we go. OK, good. Um, with the wombat in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with the wombat in the background. OK, so I, I still remember Mark Vincennes' uh, reading at the Outpost 182. And I wanted to share a, a poem uh, about Hong Kong with him, but didn't really have the chance to. But now I actually do have the chance. Uh, it's from 1998. It's about a year and a half after it went back to China. And it's called Yang. Gui Fei sings the blues. Not much has changed apart from a few red flags with five stars. Yang Gui Fei wears jeans and running shoes and sings old songs of forbidden love under naked light bulbs at night on Temple Street. A red and blue striped plastic tarp shelters the six-man orchestra seated on the asphalt. General Guan Di takes the stage holding a bamboo staff. If you enjoy his song, slip a few bucks into the straw basket. Yang Guifei will smile and offer you a stool to sit on. 
Live chickens wait for the butchers, cleaver in cages beneath red neon lights. Decapitated fish wriggle in plastic tubs and stain the water with their blood. Hui Nung stands in Gasho at the entrance to the market with his shaved head and brown robe to witness the killing demanded by a hungry city. Drop a coin into his alms bowl. He'll show you his California driver's license and give you an amulet for your protection. Monkey, imagine searching the streets for a fruit stand selling peaches. He wanders past Chinese herb shops, outdoor restaurants, video displays in camera store windows, the green and white star ferry terminal, and lights, lights, lights mirrored off the bay. Levi seems ready to fall off the pier, reaching for this reflection of Hong Kong. Monkey distracts him with a few dollars paid for an autographed book of poetry and a tale of ancient Chinese heroes. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for stepping up today. Okay, we have now Ilari Pa. So Larry, welcome back. Can Hi. we hear your poem? Can we unmute Ilari, please? Hi, nice to see you all again. Thank nice you. See you. It's been some wonderful work today. I, I love it. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, this poem is called um, Coney Island Sunset. Loneliness is a kaleidoscope in place of conversation. The loneliness of the parachute jump the cyclone, sure, and the loneliness of sunset in the Brooklyn neighborhood. Think bigger, like heaven, you said. Think how it looks from the rooftops. Think next the sky, and so I did. Then there's the loneliness of the ride and game attendants who can't get away to go to the beach, but have to wait for the season to end, only having to wait for a new season to begin without fanfare. Some don't return. There is the loneliness of the subway riders and the transit widows, the police patrolling the platforms, Stillwell Avenue and the boardwalk, even on holidays. The loneliness of children, each at the control of joysticks until running out of tokens. Each time the wonder wheel spin upward the kids wave and jump up to catch a glimpse of couples kissing, shrink down, and inside. Curiosity is the loneliness I understand best. How when we return home with your days sent on me to lay down and kiss some more, your fingers on my neck running smoothly through my hair, goosebumps stretching across my body's canvas, and the loneliness of the moon rising up, cool, brilliant, and well-rounded. Thank you, Ilari. Thank you very much. Well Thank done. you. Well done. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, Madeline Ardenberg. Madeline, let's hear your poem for us today. Welcome back. Unmute. Uh, unmute? I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Go for it. Good. Well, given the pre-reading conversation I stumbled upon uh, regarding apples, I'm going to read my poem. It has a drop title. The apple merchant said it was her first time eating an apple, but had to hide the truth, having been a seller in the market two towns over. She'd bite into each of her wares, offer only the sweetest. The buyers found it odd, then realized it made their next bite easier. The devil happened along one day, noticed Eve's pink lady cheeks, her Rome beauty breasts, and ripening delicious buttocks. He knew she knew her way around. The devil pointed to his choice. When she bent over to make change, he snatched her, planted her in the garden. Adam never really saw the fruit, only Eve's extended hand and her green eyes holding the seeds. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. Welcome back and thanks a lot for your poem Thank today. You. Well done. Thanks for a wonderful well, event. 
wonderful. We we did have a wonderful pre pre um, <laughs> pre show conversation about Apple, yeah. so that's very apt. Okay, um, Indra and Murtha Nayagam, um, we're glad to see you here today. Please give us a poem. Okay, great. You can hear me now. Thank you. We can hear Thank you. you. Know. Wonderful. I'll read a poem from uh, my recent book, The Migrant States. Um, this one's called Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now, and I'm sad. And the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories alive. And you ask, Dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turned red and yellow and the morning bristled and the sun seared yet left your skin cold? A cold sun, Dad. I feel it too. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash. And what's to do? Yes, write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed and know there's no morning flight and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Indran. We, we enjoy having you here. Thank you so very, very Thank much. And, and we enjoyed your feature here for us, too. Thank you very much. All right, next up, we have Marcus Breen. Can we please unmute Marcus? Okay. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Okay, well, I, I'm Australian, so I couldn't resist uh, speaking uh, from where I live in Boston. And... Uh, reflecting on a, a few degrees of separation. I'm a, I'm a graduate of the University of Queensland. I went to the ANU and I used to write for the Canberra Times. And uh, shockingly, perhaps, my father was instrumental in many year, for many years in organising to bring Billy Graham to Australia. I'm not sure if that's six degrees or too many. <laughs> this poem uh, will perhaps resonate with those uh, Australians who know Paul Kelly. Uh, it's called Paul Kelly Plays Boston. Forward, backward, through. Adverbs that consist of abiding joy in the thrum. As the water, so do the notes. Recollecting that collective memory on tunes in motion. Hardly breaking sweat as the Brighton Music Hall heats up. In unison, not quite nostalgic about sketchy, sketchy musical history. High-rise bombers, domestic criminals, Martin Armager, all druggy nerves, and the dots and the coloured girls, for St Steve Connolly, whose parents I loved, and the messengers, as Professor Ratbaggy, compression consolidating around his voice and my febrile heart, quivering measured pulses up to a tautening chin before surging to tear ducts that shed Melbourne boy pathos. Yes, pathetic. In a silver top to her door, an innocuous song line that points to a house in Carlton next to a lane near Argyle Place, a city green park, trees, grass, noun, guitar, Vika and Linda Bull on backing vocals as gendered sucker for a force field like radiation in a sensual crackle from a cadaverous, cada, cadaverous or is that an ethereal character on stage? No, the corpse of Kelly reverberates these Australia series artefacts. Songs he made up, discovered to be loved, transcribed into spirits, lifted beyond the starting point, linked better still to, to W.B. Yeats. Music poems that go on and on in blissful Irish mystery to a tune about a fettered Ned Kelly, the bush ranger called Sunshine to his dad, while Liz Kelly, early fatherless, claims him back for everyone, dad and dad. Come home, sunshine. Giving culture back to rock and roll, verbalising on stage other events, references to mattering abrasions from America to elsewhere. 
Marana Abramovic's 1974 Rhythm O, performance artist cruelty on display in Rock Out on the Sea, Roy Orbison's Leah, reworked as Leah, the sequel, the Langston Hughes poem album title, Life is Fine Before and After His Vocality on How to Make Gravy, which is printed on a tea towel at home. But at this moment, what I wanted is my daughter Hester to see Paul playing this theater of the kitchen and there she is, plus certainty recognized across from the rest of my standing family, gravy as identity. Even this far away, the audience become community, making goodness in the object of desire. From little things, big things grow. He must have played it a thousand times, as if the news is just happening. Even if all seems lost with Trump and Turnbull, the line is filled in by a very thin man. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you today. Um, last but not least, we have Lydia Cortez. Can we unmute Lind Lydia, please? Is that Lydia's iPad? Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? We can. we can. Thank you, Larissa. Wine because wine. Vino porque vino, porque lo trajeron. Mommy used to say, wine because wine because it was brought. Porque vino mean came, you know? But vino also, it means wine. It's funny, no? She asked. She smiled at a joke older, sillier than she. She smiled alone. I drank alone. Vino, vino, wine, wine, came, came. Vino, divino, wine came and went. Wine went when it was brought. Wind, gone with. Why wine? Sometimes I was wined and dined. All wound up. A wind-up doll. Wounds wind up opera, wounds covered up, full of less. Is funny, no? No. No, mommy never drank. I rarely smiled. Melancholic, alcoholics, not funny. Vino porque vino, porque lo trajeron. Puerto Rican wine is so syrupy, made out of pineapple. But mommy said, our fruit is so luscious, so nutritious. So said mommy. Thank you, Lydia. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is our show for today. Once again, let us please thank Cassandra Atherton, Shastra Dio, and Judith Christian, and in absentia, but with the film, John Kinsella. Thank you very much. I want to give a special thanks to our fantastic tech director and publicity doer and Facebook um, social media expert, Amanda Roberts, who is fantastic. Amanda, thank you for all that you do for us. That is our show, Jonathan and Mark. Any last words? Take care, everybody. Be careful. <clears throat> Love each other. Write a lot. That sounds good. OK, Black Lives Matter, wear your masks. God bless you all, and good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Or good morning. Good morning. <laughs>